I got eight out of nine. Cool, Alexis, go for it. Uh, you're Uh, unmute myself. Thank you, Chris. No worries. Um, Go for it. So let's move on to the first slide, please. And the next one. And the next one. Right. So who's not here today? Just, Just Sam Lambert. Lambert. Who's not here today? Just Sam Lambert. Okay. Thank you. Um, so agenda for today. Um, for me, the main topic will again be to work through the categories if we can. Uh, if we have time, which I hope we do, we'll have a quick graduation review for Gordian S and P and D. So let's let's crack on. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, amazing news, ReCubeCon. See you all there next week. Next slide. Uh, start booking 2019. Next slide. Uh, this is important. Um, the governing board now has 45 candidates for Correct. two to six USC positions. Do you want to talk through the process a bit, Chris? Yeah, uh, go to the next slide, uh, Taylor. Yeah, so uh, we have 45 candidates for the governing board selected seats and five candidates for the end user uh, seats. We're currently in the, what is known as a qualification period where governing board and voting folks are able to reach out to the candidates to ask them any questions or uh, essentially um, do anything they want to kind of vet the set of candidates. Um, after this uh, two-week qualification period uh, <clears throat> closes, there is a vote to see if these candidates are qualifying nominees. Once that happens, that final list is when uh, it will be voted upon by uh, the respective voting, voting uh, folks, whether they're governing board or end user seats, and then we'll uh, close the election and post uh, the new TOC seats by January 29th. If you have any questions, uh, let me know. I had one, Chris. Um, sure. I was just curious, the Condorcet voting system we use um, doesn't work terribly well for large numbers of choices like that? Uh, um, I mean... Limited yeah. to seven. It, do we have any thoughts or plans around that? It's literally kind of baked in the charter for us to use Condorcet IRV. So it is just uh, ranking 45 people, which it is a little bit uh, painful. But the first time we did this, I think we had a good uh, 20 or 30 set of, set of folks last, last I recall. So it, it does work. It just takes more time on the person ranking uh, who, folks. I've, I've forgotten um, who actually votes. Governing board okay. for... Um, the governing board selected seats, and then the end user board uh, votes on the end user seats. Right. Yeah. The other thing, Quinton, uh, you don't actually have to rank all 45. You could basically just, you know, pick your, let's say, six for the governing board and then just leave the rest um, uh, ranked last, essentially. But um, it's, it's up to you, up, up to you in terms of how you want to vote and do it. Oh no! I I just thought the the uh, the algorithm itself did not work for large numbers, according to what I read. But um, oh, oh. if it works fine, that's fine. <laughs> yep. Haven't had issues in the past. If there's any other questions, feel free to reach out. Otherwise, um, we'll chat uh, uh, categories. Okay, uh, move on to the next slide. Okay, so we're in the categories, great. So, sorry, can you go back please? I beg your pardon. Um, so, thank you very much for the feedback on categories uh, and SIGs. Uh, there's been a bit of discussions since in the last two weeks or so from people on the document, which is the right place at the moment to discuss it. I particularly want to thank the uh, folks around the SAFE Proto Working Group um, who've been helping out by proposing SAFE as a kind of concrete example model for what a SIG should do. Um, I think it would be useful to actually just look at that right now, if we can go to the uh, categories uh, page. Um, in fact, maybe even uh, Taylor, you could, I don't know if it will work to jump across to the, um, no, let's just look at it on our own screens. Just click click on the document. Chris has posted a link in the in Slack. I have it here. I can share it if that makes it easier. 
Yeah, why don't you do that? I mean, I'm just slightly worried that it's it's just going to exceed the screen, but uh, oh, but we can't. Yeah, we can't share two things at once. So we'll have to. Oh, here so, we go. It's on its way. Thank you. There we go. Hurrah! So if you could go down, please, to the end of the document. There's a section about the security stuff from the safe people. Okay, so this is the example, and um, this is designed to show what, what a SIG could look like uh, as a mechanism for us to debate the details. So here you can see a mission statement, which is quite general, um, essentially asserts that there's more work to be done in open source security, especially for cloud native, and then um, has a kind of vision uh, down there near the bottom of what Quinton is showing you. If you scroll down a bit, please, Quinton. And then Issa, he may not be able to speak because he's at in Barcelona. Justin, are you on the on the call today? Justin Cormack. Okay, maybe he's not. So you can see here there's a need for new projects. So one of the things that they wanted to do was solicit new projects, and you can see responsibilities. And if you go down just a tiny bit more printing, you can see deliverables. So uh, opening it up to the floor, uh, who thinks this is a plausible set of deliverables for a SIG that are presented to the TOC, which is the voting body meeting on these calls and in GitHub. Yeah, it looks good to me. Um, the one thing I see missing from deliverables there, and I just read them for the first time now, um, is, is basically the health and welfare of all the security related projects in the CNCF. Is that sort of implied there? Right, I'm actually, okay, I'm just gonna make a note of that now. Um, is anyone minuting this conversation? Because I think we didn't, didn't get enough minutes last time. Okay, I'm gonna add that to the... I, I can take minutes if no one else can. If you wouldn't mind. I'm also gonna edit the main document. Um, so I'm going to put project health checks liaison with CNCF staff because I think you know Chris and Co are doing some some health checking, um, and I'll put it at the bottom as well. Okay. Sorry, I can't edit the notes until I stop projecting this document. Okay, never mind. Let's come back to that in a minute. Help with health check of uh, projects in the category. Right. Um, Brian Grant, you had pronounced yourself a little bit uh, cautious on the notion of a safe working group. Do you think this is a better, tighter set of deliverables that would bring you over the line, or do you think you need to say more or less, maybe? Um, I hadn't caught up with the recent changes in the document, so I'm still reading through the mission statement and such okay the de de deliverables you know i think it's really important to have deliverable deliverables that users will understand and that are broadly applicable to both users and to the projects um i don't just reading the deliverables alone it's not clear that they do um so i'm reading through the rest okay. of the background Brian, um, I see you made a comment there about the serverless work white paper um, being too long. Um, just some other feedback there. So, so I was involved in the in the storage white paper, and we didn't, you know, target a particular size. We targeted a goal of of explaining a particular area, and it turned out to be about the same size as the serverless one. Uh, I personally found the serverless one very useful. Um, and I think if it had been significantly shorter, it would have been significantly less useful. And the same was my experience for this storage one. I can certainly see a value in, in having a summary of those papers for people who don't want to read a 30 page document. <clears throat> um, is that the essence of your uh, comment there that, that we should have a summary of the document as well? I think it's um, 
That's one issue, and it was specifically with that document. I haven't read the storage working group uh, white paper. I did review and comment on the serverless working group white paper. Uh, I think it could easily have been multiple separate documents that were more focused and more targeted. Uh, it was really, really broad, which I agree has value to some people. Um, I don't, I haven't really seen um, that much discussion of it uh, from people outside the, the set of people uh, who are already deeply involved with CNCF. So I don't know what kind of impact it had more broadly. Uh, but I, and that's, that's one of the issues. I mean, practically speaking, I think we need to understand who the audiences are for the things we produce and what kind of impact we expect them to have. So one of the audiences that we could state more clearly is, it's implied in, in all the stuff around education. And I think that we don't yet have a good joined up story for educational material coming out of the CNCF, which I think is a mission fail. Um, I think that having a more focused attention on each category through the SIGs could help, um, help with that and maybe provide a focus for CNCF staff to provide resources to help to solve specific issues. Um, yes, so that would be one audience. And then I think another audience is the TOC, which is X hypothesi um, a bottleneck and bandwidth constrained. And that's part of the thing being solved by this. Uh, I think what, are, what other audiences are there? Do you think maybe the, um, the community at large? I don't know. Well, I think an, another example that has been brought up by many people is the landscape diagram, the full huge landscape diagram in terms of who the audience is and what impact we expect it to have. I think we just yeah. need to be a lot more deliberate about the artifacts that we produce and how people, who is supposed to make use of them and how and what effect do we want it to have. The, uh, you know, I think the cloud native landscape is, is big and it is complex. And if we can help users understand the impact and help them understand how, what the pieces are and how they fit together and how um, it will improve things for them, but also what the risks are and how they can mitigate those risks. You know, it's, we're gonna need to be able to distill it down into something simpler. And this, you know, working groups don't need to solve this entire problem independently or by themselves. But, um, you know, I think my other concerns with working groups are more, you know, one concern is that they need to provide value and we need to understand what that value is, but also we need to just make sure that we organizationally uh, understand how to run them in an effective way. Right. So I think that comes under execution, you know, if we don't have a mechanism for articulating uh, work and then finding out how to get it done, we're not going to do anything. So. So, uh, you know, one thing that I can't help but notice with these is that the deliverables, for example, in the safe working group or safe SIG that we have are a mix of, they're, they're, it's like they're a mix of high level research, thought leadership, uh, you know, landscape building, you know, definitional stuff. And then there's just some like very nuts and bolts report on product project security, help with health checks. And I sort of wonder if those two things belong in the same group. Like, I actually think it's very easy for us to say, let's create a working group who's just, whose job is really like reporting on project security, like helping with the actual nuts and bolts work of making sure that the projects that we have in the CNCF are secure and they have the resources they need to, you know, handle vulnerabilities in timely manners and da 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 da. Um, and mixing that with the thought leadership pieces. Um, I wonder whether that's where we're where we keep getting tripped up in these working groups and and SIGs. Is anyone else concerned about that, or is that so? Is, so is that... Uh, this is Matt Farina, real quick. You know, to jump in to take this from kind of the Kubernetes perspective. 
Uh, what we've done over there is we'll have like an organizational unit and then it'll have, well, sub projects. And I think in the document, Quinton might have uh, brought this up. And so in a sub project, you might have, you know, an area, which is what a SIG owns. And then a sub project is a concrete thing. So maybe one sub project is going and producing certain reports around target audiences. Another sub project is about educating project maintainers on security and helping them audit it and get to where they're going. And you might have different sub projects because then if you need to know, okay, I'm going to this kind of thing, who owns that? What area do I go? Who do I talk to? You know, you've got one thing, but that one thing may have more than one area of responsibility and Kubernetes organizes those into sub projects. Um, not every SIG has them, but many of them do. Uh, because otherwise, yeah. how do you organize and find things? Yeah, I think I do share your concerns, Camille. And I, and I think that the model that Matt suggested is, is a reasonable way of dealing with it. The, the alternative is to have, you know, two separate sets of organizations, the execution branch and the, you know, uh, governance branch, if you like, and, and, but then if they get disconnected, they don't work very well either. So, so having them fundamentally connected is a good idea, I think. And, and the sub project model does that. In Kubernetes SIG apps, we actually discuss this at length because we have a bunch of high level things where we've done with helping facilitate the community and get people thinking about app development topics in general. And at the same time, dealing things like the workloads API and Kubernetes. And we talked about separating those and what it would mean fundamentally. And we, one of the things that hit us is we want the practitioners um, talking with the people who've got the problems and are trying to solve it so everybody can see where everyone else is coming from. And it's kind of like that uh, thing of, if you separate theory from execution, where do those paths go? Can the theory and can the teaching really solve the problems if they're disconnected from the execution? And for us, we, we chose we didn't want to go that route because we thought it would lead to problems. Are the practitioners part of that SIG? Is that an assumption you can make then? Or is there an additional process that has to happen to bring that, those opinions into the fold? We try and have everybody be part of the SIG. Um, we do have sub meetings and breakouts and things like that around specific topics if those are needed, but we make sure everybody's involved and invited and up to speed. Well, and I'm part of the Kubernetes storage SIG and I know that I think it's just kind of everyone in there. Um, and we, I wouldn't say we have a, a huge amount of customer input always. We, we try to consider that as an angle, but um, I don't know how to get all equal voices, um, which I think is what you're proposing and information to everyone. So I, I don't think there is a way to get everyone, but I think if we go back to the audiences, if we understand and well define our audiences, then we can get more information. In fact, over on Helm, one of the things we did was we said, who are our audiences? And then we stack ranked them and then we had information on them because we wanted to say, you know, where does an application developer come differently from a tooling developer, come differently from a package distributor? Because we understand, you know, we wanted to have roles and then uh, some details around profiles around those roles that we could talk to them. Because if we just say developers and end users, really who are those and, and what are their needs? I mean, I, I don't even know if we have that documented or even a base documentation to get going from a UX perspective so we can start building off of that. Um, but without those details, we're all guessing and, and going in different directions on it and maybe not having much detail, right? Uh, this is uh, Dan Shaw here, uh, one of the chairs of SAFE. Um, yeah, I, I would echo the, the fact that we, you know, definitely have, have needed to bring together um, you know, a lot of people to build up the critical mass of expertise around security. Um, you know, having multiple groups out there, you know, I'd love there to be, uh, you know, multiple groups of, you know, dense uh, activity around security, um, you know, in this particular realm. Uh, you know, I, I struggle to see, you know, that, that emerging as, um, you know, uh, several thriving groups. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of work that we put in uh, over the past year, you know, bringing together all of, of those perspectives. So uh, SAFE actually, I think, brings up a really interesting point when we talk about space and bringing it up. Because if I go look at the SAFE working group objective, it says secure access for everyone, SAFE. Working group will explore secure access, policy control, and safety for operators, administrators, developers, and end users across the cloud-native ecosystem. But if I look at security, 
right? Uh, what about signing your releases and then distributing them and having your signature be done differently? That, that's a security practice, right? But does that fit into safe? And in the safe document here, I see safe, but then I see security is a general thing. And I get that there's a bunch of things outside of that small objective of safe. And so I can't, is it just meant to be a, a subset of security or security in general? Right. So I was envisaging that at least initially there would be one group which was both security and safe, and we can we can evolve that later. I just think the say the role of this right now is just to provide a very concrete example of some what some people want to do, and so we can actually ask questions like the one Camille posed about the commingling of different granularities of work and responsibility, for instance. Uh, so let's not worry about that last question too, too much right now. I think, you know, one of the questions is, uh, can we even come up with a model that's able to execute useful work? And I think the other question is, what is the dividing line between what the TOC does as, as a voting group and what happens in, in the SIG? Those for me are the two really key questions. Enabling people to get real things done so we don't just waste time and making sure that we have the right delegation and accountability. Yeah, and Alexis, one way to phrase this may be the, the questions that we on the TOC want the SIGs to either answer or to flesh out. So I mean, the questions that I, that I have are, you know, in this space, and I think it's the, the work example is great, and we, we just need to not fall into the trap of only looking at the work example, right? We're trying to use the work example to motivate the more abstract ideas. Um, you know, the, but the questions that I have are, um, what are the established practices in this space that everyone agrees are are, are kind of the, the the lowest common denominator? And there may not be any. I mean, it, for some of these spaces, there may be the approaches are so radically different. Um, if there aren't any, what are the kind of common approaches? What are the emerging things? What are the things that that people are experimenting with? And there, I would expect there to be a couple of different approaches and a couple of different ideas. I, I think when we establish the landscape, it needs to not be as, certainly not as a set of icons on an unreadable eye chart. Um, but I think we want to ex establish the landscape with a narrative that establishes that, that there are probably different, there are different parallel paths, there are different ideas that people are experimenting with. There are things that are more emerging, there are things that are more established. Um, and I, I think that we, we might want to phrase those as questions that we want the SIG to, to ruminate on. Um, and I can try to be more specific here on the doc, but uh, that it, as opposed to, I, mean, I think we, we, we want to, when we establish the landscape, we, I, I think we want to prevent the SIG from becoming, becoming a true, a kind of a governing body. I think this is where the storage SIG, or the storage working group ran into trouble. Those who are in the storage working group can correct me if, if you disagree, but I think where they felt like they've got to adjudicate a single path and we don't actually want a single path. We want to know what the paths are that are out there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I, I agree entirely. And, and um, I don't know if, you, if everyone's aware of it, but we, we kind of reformulated the storage working group specifically around that idea. That, that was the crux of the matter. And, and I think the white paper that came out of the second phase of that um, seems to have been well received, very well received, because it's precisely that. Precisely what, sorry, Quentin? It's, it's precisely not um, dictating a one true way of doing storage. It's, right. it's an exploration of, you know, historical storage models, uh, where the strengths and weaknesses are in the context of cloud native, uh, you know, more established cloud native storage models, their pros and cons and emerging uh, storage models for cloud native and, you know, where things might go and try and provide a transparent, unbiased view of of that space <clears throat> such that we can educate users as to where the pitfalls are, what the potential solutions to their problems are, uh, what we haven't done yet and which we would like to do in the next phase is actually get case studies of failed and succeeded um, major projects so that people can learn from you know others who've gone before them as to which, what things worked well and what things didn't work well. And I'm sure right. this same principles, similar principles might apply in other areas like security 
um, serverless, etc. Yeah. Okay. So we can put. Um, I'm just putting down notes there, and then further up in the um, education section or the end user section, publish list of use cases and published examples of failures to avoid. Okay. All right. Okay, so we're just conscious of time. Um, does anyone else have a major thing they want to say right now about this document? I think we made it move this forward a tiny bit today. I need I really like to think about um, how we can take the next steps in refining what we have here and turning it into something a bit more, you know, compactly written and expressed um, that we can start to, you know, really start to kind of tear, vote on or maybe or tear apart in some ways. Um, does anyone want to? volunteer to help me to really tidy up this document. I can help if you need my help, but I wouldn't want to get in the way of anybody else. It's Quentin, um, oh, yeah. but happy to step back if anyone else has the inclination. Just and in case, some this is going to be a post KubeCon during Christmas holidays project for whoever volunteers to help me. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Alexis, I'm help. I'm happy to help you distill the the questions that I think we would like to um, to ask the SIGs to to answer. So I'm happy to ha take a swing at that. Okay. So Quentin and, and Brian Cantrell. Um, anyone else from the non-voting TOC wider community interested? Um, Aaron, I'll help. Hey, Aaron. Hi. Hi there. This is, this is Matt Farina. I'll help too. Okay, that's awesome. So Matt, Aaron, Quinton, and Trill. I'm gonna write that down. There. And um, are you are any of you not at KubeCon next week? I'll be there. I, um Alexis, I'll be there, but I leave on Wednesday morning. Okay. So I'll email you about about maybe meeting up or something. Cool. Um, right. So, Chris and Taylor, please could you take us to the next topic, which I believe to be the um, uh, core DNS graduation discussion. And um, for Quinton, you'd like to go to the screen. Great. Taylor, would you mind projecting again? Thank you. Okay, Chris, what's the process here? Let's, uh, is Francois or anyone from core DNS yes, here to present? Okay, here. perfect. Cool. Go ahead. Okay, so yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So my name is Francois Thur, and I am one of the maintainers of the CoreDNS project. Um, so CoreDNS, I, I guess it's a time of the annual review. Uh, just to recall that we we did the first applying as inception project in March 2017, and then almost one year later, it was the first annual review where we applied for incubation in February. 2018. So now is annual review, but on the same time application for a graduate project. Um, core DNS, I just remind a little, it's, it's a production grade DNS server. Uh, in, in Go language, the main point is it is uh, written in plugins, in architecture plugins that make it very easy uh, for any user to adapt for whatever you want, either by reusing existing plugins, either by writing your own. So what we did uh, uh, during these years, I mean, since March 2017, is we have, we have a, a bunch of plugins available. And we tried last year already to start, we started to develop uh, plugins for Kubernetes. Which, uh, that means several plugins. The one, the main one that say, OK, uh, um, we handle Kubernetes as a um, Authority, uh, authority server, DNS server, but there are also some about federation or Kubernetes that allow uh, several to, to handle several uh, cluster. Um, what we did this year, so here is is, is the year is um, 
the main point of this year is adoption of CoreDNS. So here I show 25 public production users. I guess there is much more. Um, uh, 25 is because we, we did a survey, uh, thanks to CNCF, um, to, to know who is using um, uh, core DNS. And then some people replied, yes, I'm okay to, to show up in your adopter list. What we did this year is, okay, follow up uh, is, is more, ensure that uh, core DNS is reliable, is perform as expected and, and has the right tunage. So it's more maturity of core DNS on one side and the other side is um, integrate core DNS as a component of Kubernetes. Um, that was already in the plan when we presented for incubation uh, beginning of this year. So now it is done. So I'm, I'm happy to copy past this morning <laughs> the tweet that happened yesterday evening that showed the release of Kubernetes 1.13 that, that was released yesterday and that say core DNS is a default DNS plugin. It, was, it, it is uh, the major, uh, one of the major uh, achievement of this year for core DNS. Um, however, now that we have this maturity and we have uh, uh, all this stability on core DNS, we are pushing for a new plugins um, that will come, uh, they are under review right now, uh, that will come in, in uh, coming months. Uh, can we go to next slide? Uh, thank you, Chris. So CoreDNS community, um, I don't know how to show, I, I know that each project try to show here. I took the numbers we showed up at the beginning of this year and where we are right now uh, after one, a, a little less than one year. So uh, the contributor, for example, went from 40 to, to 112. Um, the, the more uh, um, amazing thing for me is the Docker pool, the 10 million Docker pools uh, from our uh, Docker core DNS, which does not include the Kubernetes uh, um, pool for core DNS, because in that case, we, we host the image of core DNS in the GCR.io. So it's only for the core DNS uh, repository. Uh, what I wanted to show here is maybe on the, this graphic on the, on the bottom is uh, what happened for the adoption by the developers of core DNS. So you see these two lines. So one is, is the stars, but the second one uh, that grew up the same way. And you can see the, the, the increase from inception, incubation, graduation is the fork of the project. So that means you have now four, 450 folks of core DNS means people that try to understand, try to maybe make a little change or, or just to browse and understand what happened inside. And that's a huge um, achievement also. Um, so that's the numbers, I don't know. And next one, thank you. So that is the application for graduation. Uh, we show here that we, um, um, that we fit on each of the criteria that CNCF defined. So there is a PR open. Um, there are stats. Uh, you can follow the stats for the, for the project that is uh, um, stats that are monitored by CNCF. Um, as uh, we have 16 maintainers, um, CoreDNS is more independent uh, um, developer oriented than company. So we have, we have a uh, um, company involved, but uh, most of the, of the maintainers are independent or, or prefer to be considered as independent than uh, part of a company. Um, we have last, I think last, like last year, 12 release. So that means uh, uh, quite uh, uh, often a uh, high rate of, of release. The average of peer merge is a little lower or, or little, uh, I just say, steady. It did not go up because we focused more on the reliability, on the performance, than to add and add and add uh, features. So um, one uh, one thing. So globally, this peer has been uh, approved by uh, Jonathan Bull, that is our sponsor for COC, the sponsor of CoreDNS. Um, I don't know, I guess now the, the process is for everyone that has to vote to maybe uh, go into that peer. Um, 
I think that's all what I had to say for the presentation. Let me know if you have question. I have I one. Them. Yes. Uh, yeah, I was just curious. So from what I remember, uh, Core DNS originated out of CoreOS, is that right? Uh, no. CoreOS, no. Oh. Um, then I retract my question. <laughs> No, 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 it's not. Uh, it's the same, same kind of name, but it's not linked to that company. No. Okay, but it is an etcd backed DNS server. There is one of the plugins is etcd. Yes. Okay, you, my apologies. You can use etcd as the backing, but it also can back by other things. So when we use it with Kubernetes, it does not. It's not backed by etcd. It's directly talking to the Kubernetes API server. Okay. Thank you telling me they did some kind of a change that I think. <clears throat> Any other questions uh, from the TOC or the community? Are, are there major uses of core DNS outside of Kubernetes or is it mainly Kubernetes? Um, there are some. That's why on, on the on the first uh, slide, I, I I there are two kind of usage. Yes, out of Kubernetes and inside Kubernetes. It is sure that uh, let's say some cloud and for blocks uh, admiral uh, uh, are using as DNS service. Uh, uh, sometimes they are also using Kubernetes around, but but they are not using on the on the they are not using core DNS as the as the standard usage in Kubernetes. Uh, however. I mean, the size of Kubernetes make that, um, uh, I guess that a, a big proportion of the production user will be within Kubernetes. And we can see, I think there is a, an ongoing uh, CNCF pod, um, uh, survey that show that um, all version, within all version of Kubernetes, now that 45% of, of the responder to that server say, say that they are using core DNS as a DNS server for Kubernetes. Does it reply your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, of the 16 maintainers, how many are active in the project still? Well, they are, they are all active, but on the 16, maybe you can have a set of five, six that are much more active, but they are all, uh, um, they are all maintainers. There is a, um, okay. We talk a lot of how, how uh, for this graduation criteria, we had to write down our governance. <laughs> and so that was a, a kind of process where we had a lot of talk. Um, the, the ex, for the governance, we wanted to be open for maintainers. So that's why we have a, a, an important number of maintainers. The, the one that are more active, I think, are the six, six or seven first one in the list. If you look at the uh, six or seven first contributor in uh, coordinates. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's move on to the next presentation. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you Francois. Thank you. In terms of order, uh, if the original TOC sponsor or someone else from the TOC wants to propose this for a graduation vote, um, they could do that. So. Feel free to reach out to me if you intend to do that. I think that was me, right? Cord, on Core DNS, it was uh, Jonathan Bull, I believe. Oh, it was Bull, okay. So he's on, 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 online. Do you want to ask him now quickly? Yeah, I'm happy to sponsor it. Does, does that mean we need one other person as well? Or? No, uh, we just need one person to say do a vote, and then we'll vote whether it graduates and it needs two thirds supermajority to graduate. So if you're okay, yeah, if you're okay with that, Jonathan, I, I could, I'm happy to kick off uh, a vote formally. Uh, yep, I am. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Fluent D people. To be Eduardo. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Go for it. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. 
Thank you. Well, uh, my name is Eduardo Silva. I'm part of the Fluidity team uh, since a lot of years. And the goal of this uh, graduation presentation is try to demonstrate uh, what is the current status of the project since uh, we joined it incubation on November 2016, two years ago. So uh, nowadays, FluentD is a real production grade login solution and it's been used uh, mostly by major cloud providers and major distribution of uh, companies that distribute Kubernetes or are also standalone solutions that are not containerized by like Google, Microsoft, and Red Hat. Uh, in terms of growth, we have seen a huge growth in the, in the last years. And for example, in the last 10 months, we have seen around 35 million Docker pools from our official registry. And since then, uh, this has been growing a lot. Uh, not, not just uh, how, many, how many people is using Fluentd with Kubernetes and standalone services, but also from a community and developer perspective. Next slide, please. OK. In, in the last year, so the first year after inception uh, at KubeCon, that was one year ago in the US, we released at Fluentd 1.0. And since then, we had done like 62 releases and the last release that we have available is 1.3.1 that, one, that was uh, is available since like seven days ago and also we have seen some kind of awareness and knowledge on our github repository where currently we have like 7,000 github stars next slide please uh, one important thing to understand about fluentd itself that uh, it behaves a bit different than on in the way that works with other projects with the, with the developers and its ecosystem. Fluentd itself is like a really small code base, but most of the major features and, and extensions that are available are based on plugins. And plugins can be created by anyone or any company. When we joined it on incubation, like two years ago, we had like 600 plugins. And nowadays we have more than 800 plugins, which has been updated in the last year. So we are quite amazed because uh, you will understand that we as maintainers, maybe we focus on the Fluentd core base and also on no more than 20 plugins. So you can see that there are many companies contributing back in their own way. And since Fluentd, of course, is like a base on a Ruby ecosystem, uh, that these plugins are published in the, in the Ruby gems registry and everybody can get them and take advantage of that. In addition to the, to the plugin as an ecosystem, uh, we also provide like language SDKs. So for example, if you're writing your application in Go, Node.js or any kind of language, you can ship your logs directly from your own code to Fluentd. So Fluentd can also behave not just like a log forwarder, but also as an aggregator. And we have seen most of this, uh, this model where people ship logs from application to Fluentd is mostly outside of the Kubernetes world. And we got a lot of traction with that. People writing application in Java is using that in Python and Golan. Next slide, please. And in the, in the last time we did, uh, we, so when, since we joined in, 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 the, in the incubation phase, we focused a lot on how to be a better citizen with the enterprise or major solutions that are around for different areas. As you know, as a login solution, you need to connect the dots between different input source of data and ship that data to a, a central place or a different cloud provider. And there's a lot of complexity between that because you need to deal with a data formatting, parsing, buffering, you need to provide a reliable way to accomplish that. And I would say that in the last time, we have focused a lot on Kubernetes, a, a good integration with Kafka. We maintain a, also the official plugins for Splunk, Elasticsearch, a integration for Node.js application, which is a custom thing. And also we did a, a better integration with Prometheus. So in general, we have tried to make a increase for the whole adoption and work better with the community in terms of create for the ex more extensions for it. And also, we focus a lot of how to integrate better with the enterprise. And we're quite happy that how Fluentd has been growing in the, in the last time. And I think, uh, that, so, so the whole team is, is pretty happy. And our goals for the next year is start working in the next version will be 2.0. So that will start since in January.
So uh, in representation from the Fluent D team, I would like to ask for the TOC to start a, the, the voting process. And if you have any questions now, please just let me know. Thank you. Yeah, I had, I had one that's Quinton here uh, around your 800 plugins. Um, on the one hand, it sounds very impressive. On the other hand, it, it maybe makes me wonder how specific these are rather than being more general. Um, I was curious, you know, what does that landscape of 800 plugins look like? As far as I understand, there are producer plugins and consumer plugins. Uh, is that true? Yeah, actually, we have more categories. One of them is like we call it input, what you say consumer. We have filter plugins, we have parser pl plugins, buffering plugins, and output plugins. So all about what you need, because sometimes you have the, the right plugins to consume the data, but you need to write your specific filter to parse, uh, so, sorry, specific filter to apply some kind of threshold or, or I don't know, obfuscate some data that is coming in from your source. And also people try to create their own parsers because the data doesn't have a proper structure and they need to structure that data in a special way. So the, the best way, instead in, so in of extend Fluentd for that in the code base, we provide a flexible ecosystem with plugins so people can create their own solution. And the way to do it is using the, like the RubyGem ecosystem can, where the code can be Ruby or C and then people can pull those plugins easily because also in the Fluentd distribution, we provide our own tooling to get those right uh, plugins for the right version that Fluentd is running. Okay, thank you. That answers the question well. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Who was the original sponsor of this fund, Chris? It was Brian, <coughs> Brian Grant. Oh yes, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd encourage everyone to also look at the stats of these projects as we look at the graduation reviews from the uh, <coughs> project health dashboard I posted earlier. What would you, could you just um, get a couple of snapshots for the two projects and just attach them to a post sure. of the TOC? This would be super helpful. Yep. Yep. Um, we'll do. The dev stats is really good, Chris. Good job. It's, it is still quite, um, it's quite a kind of information encyclopedia that I think not everyone will immediately understand how to use. Yep. Okay. Uh, also, <coughs> go ahead. No, no, you, you, you go ahead. Yeah, no, no, I sent out a note on the mailing list if there's feedback on, on the project health dashboard that's kind of uh, in beta, but there's a lot of information. Um, there right now. Yeah. yeah, so it'd be good to see how you would see this dashboard being used to assess progress for something like Fluentd. Yeah. Cool, okay, um, please can we go on to the next slide, please, Taylor? Uh, I think we probably yeah, we're, <coughs> over the yeah. line, I think. Yep, uh, we're pretty much uh, done. Yep. Um, got about six minutes left, so if there's any yeah. questions. A few reminders, there is a, a Meet the TOC public session. I think it's on Tuesday afternoon. Is that right, Chris, at uh, Santiago? Yep. And I believe that there is also a opportunity for anybody to book a meeting with individual members of the TOC if they make themselves available, which the CNCF will handle. Chris, how do you plan to publicize that to people? Uh, we, we need uh, you to sign up first in terms of availability for TOC members and the link that I sent to you and then uh, it will be posted on the schedule and people could just show up. Okay. Any other it, things? It, 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 Chris, is there a demand for that? It's, it's, it strikes me as peculiar, honestly. Uh, lots of people want to talk to uh, TOC members to potentially bring in new projects or get feedback on stuff. So yeah, there is a bit of a uh, demand. Okay, but is that what it's about? Because I, I really do. I mean, I don't know that 
that have booking time for us to be individually lobbied by projects is a good use of anyone's time. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I think people are going to find you one way or another, but there is demand for it. So um, it's up to you whether you want to sign up for it or not. Fair enough. Okay. Thanks. People just want to meet you, Brian, and, and hug you. It, it almost disgusts me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyone got any other questions about kind of meetings, <coughs> gatherings, parties? Next Monday, there's, there's a GB face to face. Really, anything to do with KubeCon that that we any of us should take away as an action before before KubeCon that that's burning real soul. So there was some confusion, I guess, about whether the TOC was invited to the meet with the GB. It sounds like we are not. In general, would that be for the Monday afternoon GB uh, meeting or for some kind of social event? Uh, for either one. Okay. I, I think it would be a good thing for the GB to mingle with the TOC once in a while. And maybe Chris, you could see if you can pull some strings there. Yeah. Yeah. Generally not for the board meeting, but for social events, we could be a little bit more flexible. Let me, let me check to see what we could do. And there was last year and there seems to be a change that there will not be this year is what I just heard. We can have a kid's table for the TOC. <laughs> we can all wear our special kind of plus one mining t-shirts. Okay. Cool. Thank you, everybody. See you so, next week. Um, was there ever any an event uh, organized for the end user group, um, or jointly between the end user group and the TOC? Uh, I suspect Cheryl would know the answer to that. I don't know if she's yeah. on the call. Yeah, I'll follow up. I'll follow up with Cheryl. I believe she's at uh, DockerCon right now, so she's probably not not online. But I'll follow up. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Good luck. See you next week. Bye-bye. Cool. Take care. Great. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. Thanks. Bye. Bye.